the heart of art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good evening everyone, welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today on the show we have a very special guest. Uh, her name is Lisa Urban. She is an art teacher at St. Joseph's Catholic School. Um, but uh, I interviewed her because of her 3D fiber sculptures um, that I saw at the Bryan College Station Community Showcase. Um, she uses yarn to create different uh, shapes and the lighting to create different effects within the yarn. And I mean, it's so awesome. Um, she also does uh, oil painting of fantastic landscapes that also incorporates this yarn into her painting. So we have a great conversation um, about her unique art style. So make sure you tune in for that. Uh, we will also revisit our conversation that we had with Jen Korolenko, who is the curator of education for the um, Forsyth Galleries. Um, and she also has some really awesome works at the Bryan College Station Community Showcase at the MSC that you can go check out. Uh, now for our, our announcements, we have the Bryan Contemporary Artists, BCA, and our guest today, Lisa Urban, is actually the founder of this organization. Um, and we do have a conversation about this uh, in our interview. So the BCA, the Bryan Contemporary Artists, currently have an art show called Luminescence, and it is showing right now uh, at the Village in downtown Bryan. Ryan, and it is up right now until August 15th so you still have some time to check it out and I encourage you to do so it is a really cool you know interpretation of the word luminescence by all these contemporary artists so there's a lot to look at um, and remember if you do have any uh, art announcements or uh, you would like to be interviewed about your own art make sure to email the heart of art at tamu.edu that's the heart of art at tamu.edu all right let's start the show Today in the studio, we have a very special guest. Her name is Lisa Urban. She is an art teacher at St. Joseph Catholic School for middle and high school level. Uh, but she is also an oil painter, a 3D fiber sculpturer, and an abstract figurative drawer. Uh, she currently has some works up at the Bryan College Station Community Showcase that you can check out right now at the MSC on the second floor. And her works are Illuminate and Texas Bomb. So make sure you go check them out. So hi, Lisa. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Great to be here. Awesome. I'm excited for a conversation today because you do a lot of art. You have a lot of content to go over. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, I mean, I like to go over the background on my guests first and see where their love for art began. Um, so where did your art love for art begin? Oh, man, I think I've been making art my whole life. Honestly, I had really good teachers in elementary, middle and high school, and they just really pushed me and gave me the what I needed to to pursue it further after after school, you know. Awesome, so. awesome. And where was this? This was back in Kansas. Kansas. Um, I actually okay. grew up in Kansas, and I moved here right after college. So, oh. um, yeah. And what was the reason for moving to here? Was it here in Bryan where you it moved was, to? It's sort of. Um, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I can condense it a bit. Um, I graduated from Kansas State in the fall of 2013, and I was looking for excuses to get to Texas because I thought I wanted to go to graduate school at UT Austin. I was like, if I live in state, then I can pay less. Um, right. And so I applied for a residency in Navasota through the Arts Council of the Brazos Valley. Awesome. And I got it. I was one of three artists who moved down in the fall of 2014 to do this artist residency at the historic Horlock House in Navasota. Wow. Um, the residency is actually still going on today. It's been going on for about eight or nine years now. Nice. And Congratulations I did that. for that, by the way. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was a really good experience, especially for me being right out of college and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. um, I did that. It was supposed to be six months. I ended up staying for a whole year because hmm. um, I really liked the area. I told the Arts Council I kind of wanted to stick around. So they offered awesome. me an extra six months. And then after that, I had fallen in love with Bryan College Station to the point where I just decided to move here and make this my home. Right. Most people do fall in love with their yeah. area. <laughs> yeah. uh, what are your, some of your like earliest memories of art? What were some of the things that you were interested in as, as a little girl? Uh, well, coloring books were huge. I had, mm. you know, grandma who always gave me coloring books and markers and crayons and just things like that. But even then, I remember I remember some very specific projects, even from elementary school of just like 
doing watercolor with abstract lines and like we did a Van Gogh sunflower one year and just all kinds of just things like that that just I've because I love art so much it's just stuck with me even mm. to this day awesome awesome yeah I'd like to go straight into the art uh specifically in in your case because I think that your memories are really tied into your art and that's mm -hmm. something that I've seen along with your Illuminate series um and I did want to ask what came first your painting or your knitting oh man um I think I've been an artist longer than I've been a knitter. I actually okay. picked up knitting when I was in college. People always are like, oh, did oh. you learn that as a kid? And I'm like, no, I just started it in college. Um, right. But I've been making art my whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely probably the painting or at least the art making. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in college, my senior year, and we were developing portfolios. I, at that point, was addicted to knitting. And I told my professors, I really want to incorporate knitting into my art somehow. Right. And that just is kind of when that happened. Awesome. Oh, I, I love that. Specifically in your painting, how would you describe your painting style? Um, I always tell people that I paint surrealistic landscapes made up of knitted forms. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. very specific. Yeah. You have to see it to understand it. But mm -hmm. once you see it, you get it. Yeah. Um, I love that your love for knitting kind of took over all of your art because you, you see it all throughout your art, through your painting. Um, you see that knitting. Um, when did you start connecting knitting with your memories? Uh, probably in like 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. So the sculpture that you saw at the MSC is kind of related to memory. And I've done other sculptures that are also related to memory, but it actually started with my paintings. So mm -hmm. Since about 2017, my paintings have been more like waterscapes with the forms floating in them. And there's always one that's glowing. And I mm -hmm. always tell people or I relate it somehow to saying that that glowing form is like your most prominent memory. It's the one that sticks in your brain, something you remember. And then mm -hmm. there's usually some other forms in there that are starting to fall back. They've got lots of layers of paint over them. You can't really see them. And those I always kind of relate to like the ones that are kind of falling from your memory. You, they're fuzzy. You, they're there, but you just don't remember them. Mm -hmm. um, and right. so that's kind of like when the whole memory idea came into play. Awesome. And is creating this cathartic for you in a way or what, what does it do to you? It, it's very well, painting in general is very cathartic. It's mm -hmm. a good it's a good way for me to relax. But so is knitting. And that's even when I was before I was doing like the waterscapes with the memory related. I always said that like knitting was magical. Knitting was a way for me to escape, to get away from the pains of everyday life. I didn't have a hard childhood, but there were a lot of times when I just wanted to, like, escape. And so right. I would watch Disney movies. I would watch cartoons. I would do things like that. And so then when I learned how to knit in college, I kind of did the same thing. It was a way for me to escape, just right. sit down, let my brain just kind of relax and not really think about anything except what I was making. Right. I know. Well, I kind of wanted to tie that into there was this piece where each – I think um, you chose a month of October and each day was like a different memory. Each not, not was like a different memory yeah. of like each day. Um, and then seeing that as like a whole piece together of, of like a, a consumption of time, you know, put together. Um, is that a way of you of like reflecting on your past, you know, once yeah. it's finished? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm really glad you brought that one up. Um, I need to go back to that because I haven't done it in a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think that piece was in 2019. But the idea was that I wanted a way to make these globes that represented me and like my time and like my memories or my physical experience of the day. So yeah, I was doing this big ball and I did it for, I did one ball to represent a week and each day of that week, I did a different stitch pattern depending on if my day had been easy or hard. And as a teacher, you just never know how your day is going to be. Right. Um, so that was a really fun. And then I think I did, yeah, for the whole month of October, I did like five different globes that represented the month of October. Yeah, I love that. That was a great way of, you know, physically seeing time. It was amazing. Um, between painting and knitting, how do you divide your time between the two? It kind of depends. Um, right now, I'm doing a whole lot more knitting than I am painting. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, like, I'm just, I haven't been feeling it lately. I don't know what's going on. But um, other times, I would really just rather be in the studio painting. I, I think... Like when we went into quarantine for COVID, I had this opportunity. I could have knocked out a million paintings and I knocked out one. Right. But then like in 2021, I was working towards a solo show with all my paintings. And so I knocked out like 10. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's very, it's just, it, it comes and goes. Right. It's but, random. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever inspiration comes, yeah. you can't force it. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, what is uh, your artistic bro- process like? Does it begin with a memory like you did in that, or how, how, how does that go? Um, for my paintings, it usually actually begins more with like a color scheme or some kind of like sketch or landscape layout. Uh, a lot of my paintings, like I said before, are kind of inspired by like animation or Disney or like things that from my childhood. So I'll often um, kind of use that as the basis of the inspiration. And then I'll, I actually set up a still life in my studio um, on the floor at this point because I'm looking down. It's for the waterscape and it's usually like the glowing ball with a light bulb underneath it and then other balls and plastic wrap and colored papers and that's kind of like the basis that I start my paintings from. And then once I get a couple layers on the canvas, I kind of stop looking at it and just do what I feel is right. Hmm. Um, in terms of the sculpture pieces, I definitely would, you know, I kind of had to start with the, the memory or the what had happened that day to give me an idea of what stitches I was going to make or what pattern I was going to use. Mm-hmm. And how do you make it stiff or harden? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So that's an interesting question. And I actually, this is one of those moments when like teaching has informed my art because the whole idea came about when I was doing a paper mache project with my students. Uh, um, I, we were just doing it and I was like, I could totally do this with my knitting. So I make the, I make the form. I blow up a balloon inside of it once I'm completely done. I dip it in watered down glue. I let it dry. And then when I'm done, I just pop the balloon. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I've never I've never seen that done before. So yeah. that's a really unique uh, technique you have there. Yeah. Um, where do you see your art going next? I mean, now that you know you had painting and then you combined your love for knitting mm-hmm. with painting, like what else are you gonna combine? So I've been working the sculpture in question that like you kind of saw at the MSC. That one is actually from I think 2019, and I had started to develop a series where I was writing down a memory from my childhood like every single evening before I went to bed. And I was making little tiny ones that I was going to have represent each of those memories in my journal. Mm -hmm. And I did a show with like, I wanted it to be a whole year, Um, a whole year's worth of memories from childhood and all of that. And I actually did a show where I had about half of them um, at a place called Art of War in downtown Bryan. Um, It's not open anymore. Mm. And that was like right before COVID. And so my hope had been like, if I do this half show, then I can propose it to do in galleries in other places with like a full year's worth of well, COVID hit, so that never really happened. I've still sent the proposal places, but I haven't really gotten anything from it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea was that these would actually be hanging from the ceiling and you'd be able to like walk through my memories. Wow. Um, yeah. Since coming out of you know the 2020 and everything like that, I haven't made any more. I still have all the ones that I had. And like I said, I've sent the proposal a few places. I haven't gotten any nibbles. And so I've kind of, I haven't really worked on the globes the sculpture pieces as much since like 2020 but i'm still painting i'm mm-hmm. still developing that style i'm still doing all of those waterscapes um my current series is actually color schemes inspired by songs from disney movies all right because awesome. i really like i just have this weird obsession with disney <laughs> so i've done three or four pieces that are just like the color schemes from the disney movies still using the glowing form as the most prominent and having the other ones kind of floating around it right. um and then I have still been doing some fiber art because I've recently started doing um, cutting apart canvases with acrylic pores and doing some weaving into them, like to having the weaving interact with the acrylic pore. It's you'd have to see it to understand it, mm-hmm, right. but it's been that's been fun, too. So that's been kind of like the 3D work that I've been working on lately. But I do want to go back to making more of those sculptures again. Awesome. Awesome. And if people want to have, you know, this is radio, so they can't really see it. If they do want to have a visual representation of it, do you have a website where they can go and check out your work? I do. Um, my website is just Lisa Urban, and that's U-R-B-A-N mm-hmm. art dot com. Um, I also have Instagram, Lisa underscore 24 underscore 7. Um, I post more frequently on Instagram than updating my website. And you, they can find your social medias on the website as yeah. well, right? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And I encourage everyone to go check out the, her work. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I, I, one of the ones that stuck out to me was the, the tree made out, out of uh, mm-hmm. knitting and the balls everywhere. It just looked like a, a fantastical world. And yeah. It's just so cool. It's awesome. Um, do you have any upcoming shows or dates that you want people to know about? So I actually have a good amount going on um i am opening on friday the whatever tomorrow is 
Anyway, so at the Arts Council, there is going to be a teacher show that I've got a couple pieces in. Awesome. And that will go until the middle of August. Um, I'm also in the MSC Spotlight Showcase show. Mm-hmm. And um, a few years ago, I actually co-founded an artist group here in town called Bryant Contemporary Artists. Uh-huh. And that was me trying to find other artists who were doing things besides portraits and landscapes, like abstract type things or just more contemporary art. And we are actually hanging a group show at the Village Cafe in downtown Bryan on Monday, the 18th. July 18th. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that will be up until like August 15th. Okay. And nice. I'll have some pieces in that as well. All right. Awesome. This might air after that. Uh, yeah. But, but we can reference it and yes. encourage people to go and check out what's going on with your organization. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything about your art that you think we haven't mentioned yet that you want people to know about? I don't think so. I think my art is very visual, so I definitely encourage you guys that are listening at home to go find me on social media or find my website, check out my latest works. Um, and just just because I'm a knitter, like look at the a lot of people see other things in my paintings. They see sea urchins, they see flowers, they see other shapes. So like, don't let the idea of the whole knitting thing like scare you off. Oh, yeah. It's it's very freeing. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for stopping by. I, I had a great time. Uh, I learned so much. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It was fun being here. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studio, we have a very special guest. Her name is Jennifer Korolenko, but she likes to go by Jen. And she's currently the curator curator of education and public programs at University Art Galleries and Forsyth Galleries. Hi, Jen. How are you today? Hello, Hector. I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm very excited for a conversation today. I like to start off by going over the background of my guests first and see where their love for art began. Sure. So I wanted to ask you, where is home for you? Home for me is actually Trenton, New Jersey. So quite a a long distance from Aggie lands. Yes, very much so. And is that where your love for art began? It is. Um, I was kind of an odd duck in my family. Uh, I was a big reader and writer and doodler, I guess, Mm -hmm. until I picked up paints in my teenage years, I guess. Uh, No one else in my family really had a particular interest in art or music or anything cultural. And I know that sounds terrible. (laughs) Yeah. But I come from a big, a really big Italian and Irish family on the East Coast. So everybody is about cooking and eating and talking really loud and projecting their voices. Um, Not necessarily about going to the opera or taking a stroll through a museum. But my parents were incredible. Um, They were kind of like, we don't get you, but we support you. (laughs) Yes, my parents were the exact same way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they don't really think they have time for the arts, but... (laughs) Right, right. My mom has taken me to so many museums where I've pointed out, like, very enthusiastically, some squares inside of squares, like a Joseph Albers kind of situation, and I'm geeking out about it, and she's just nodding her head and smiling politely, like, when's lunch? Mm -hmm. This is not... Okay. She's there for you. She's there for you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Definitely emotional support. (laughs) Um, I saw that you uh, got your Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Art Teacher Education from the College of New Jersey. I did. I was wondering about the art scenes in New Jersey and Texas and like how they differ. Um, Yeah. Do do you have anything? Uh That's a really good question. I think uh, the Northeast, while it is a smaller geographical location, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I come from an area where I'm basically in that like little armpit part of New Jersey that's like in the little curve on uh-huh. the inside part, yeah, uh, not near the ocean. Um, so basically, we call ourselves the tri state area, and that's basically just New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. So while Trenton not necessarily didn't have a huge art scene that I discovered until probably like my late teens, early 20s, um, I had access to the tri-state area, so I was was able to visit New York and Philadelphia and hubs of cities like that. Um, The art scene here in Texas is kind of similar insofar as 
there are like metropolitan hubs of art and culture mm-hmm. within the state of Texas. Okay. And then there are also pockets of weird that we like to sprinkle throughout. And I think the same is true for the tri-state area. Okay. Those pockets of weird. I'm yeah. Still <laughs> okay. Um, and I can see through your background that you are very invested in the relationship between education and art. Yes. I was wondering, uh, why do you think it's important for children to learn about art? Or what do you think it, it does for them? I think art generally helps people express themselves in ways in which they have difficulty communicating, whether that be verbally, whether that be in a written capacity, whether that be visually. And it's a symbiotic relationship between the artist and the viewer and society and the artist. And that constant flow of conversation and flexibility has always been so, so interesting to me. And you just see people open up when they're exposed to art. And the same is true. It's easy to get, you know, to get a five-year-old to say, wow. I mean, that's incredibly easy. Mm But the problem with not being exposed to the arts at incredibly young ages when they're developmentally more impressionable, let's say, when you're forming you're forming who you are through your experiences, nature, nurture, all that stuff. Um, but having the tool of creative problem solving, creative thinking, just creative curiosity to explore more, to learn more. It kind of fosters that whole lifelong learning element that we're now pushing in society to realize, okay, so we've met pretty much mostly everyone's basic needs. Like you don't have to go and hunt an animal to eat at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with this spare time that we would normally be like running away from, from predators in the wild? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Mm -hmm. that is where the arts can help us to really strive and to really be successful and to get outside of our comfort zones because that is incredibly important I think to be a well-balanced and not necessarily logical person but a person who can hold a debate when it comes to many topics throughout their lives so I think it's just a really helpful and intuitive tool that we all have in us yeah I feel like it helps reinforce like your own ideas and make them stronger as well so thank you for doing that for children in our oh I'm, I'm happy to do it I love being a goofball I was wondering um as curator of education and what does that exactly entail okay so curating we I think we use that word curate and curating like the act of curating mm-hmm. um pretty heavily and today when we're talking about ourselves as influencers as creators as makers generally as that has gone beyond the classroom and beyond the artist as um, someone who's working within their practice. It's something that everyone does. They curate their Instagram. They curate their liked TikTok videos. They curate who they text their TikToks to, you know, like who you share them with. Yeah. Um, So the act of curating is basically just selecting the things in which speak to you or hold information in which you would like to find more about and then kind of creating a narrative around it. So the curator will select the objects that they want for a specific art show or an exhibition rather. And they will also create a sort of theme um, based on those objects. And that can be really, really obvious. Like maybe we do everything that has a flower on it for this exhibition. Mm -hmm. But where my job starts to get come into play in the process of curating in a museum, um, environment is that I then take those themes and this academic style writing, which curators classically will write very academic style uh, papers and labels and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, My job is to then digest that information and make it accessible for the average person. Okay. So if I don't know if you've ever had a prof who used to tell you to, to write to you know, the reading level of like a fifth grader or something like that, which is generally what people are. Mm -hmm. Um, It's about that, but it's also about making it content in which people want to create, um, want to consume rather, because we are so bombarded with that kind of thing. Um, It's my job to go through not only the objects, but the techniques, the artists, their lives, their misadventures, their successes, and also the context of social 
um, social matters that were within the context of the time period and make that all digestible and more easy to understand for somebody who's just going to walk in off the street. And I assume that you know nothing. That's my assumption when I talk to anyone about any piece of art. Awesome. I'm assuming that you know nothing and I will meet you where you are. Right. Okay. All right. I wanted to ask you um, something a little more personal. What are some pieces that have inspired you or, and that might've been like that have my have seen at Forsyth or something that um, made you want to pursue art even? Well, I think generally, um, I think the moment that I decided that art was going to be my career, that I was going to teach people about art is actually when I started speaking to people in public about art. Hmm. So in college, when I was having to take classes and do critiques and things like that, uh, I took a conceptual art course. And that really took me outside of my comfort zone in thinking that art was about a physical object, not necessarily an experience. Hmm. And it was all about doing a technique perfectly, about perfecting a craft rather than exploring like an element of human behavior. So for me, what I found really interesting was how artists were able to, in contemporary and conceptual art, were able to almost recreate certain human experiences in a gallery setting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, there was an artist um, who did this. I don't want want to misspeak her name, um, but she designed these little, almost, I I want to say, to say, to call them dioramas is really an understatement, but it was, you looked into this tiny box and when you stuck your eyes in, you looked and it looked like a movie theater and, um, and it was quiet and you had headphones on. So you're looking into this box, you're in a gallery, you're looking into this weird plain black box. And when you look in, there's a movie playing and it's not anything specific. It's just images flashing here and there. But then you start to hear in surround sound through your headphones, a cough, a shuffle, someone sighing. So oh, it sort yeah. of recreates the experience of just going to the movies, wow. but you're not at the movies. Right. You're at the Met or wherever you are, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's just so interesting. It's like time travel. Like, yeah. what is this witchcraft? That, <laughs> that like a portal. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that element just kind of really opens it up to me. And it's like art just doesn't have to be an image. Hmm. It can be so much more than that. And right. as things develop and as we develop as a people, um, it's only going to get more and more interesting and exciting. All right, you guys, that is the end of our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And a big thank you to Lisa Urban for stopping by and teaching me about her unique art style. Uh, Thank you so much and make sure to tune in next week. I'm Hector Nino and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu.